Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Immigration Plenary, Pathways to Success, the Congressional Champions. The CHCI R2L Next Gen program brings low-income Latino high school students from across the country to D.C. for one week, all expenses paid. We are so proud to have you here. Participants get to spend five days learning about how the federal government works, meeting important leaders, visiting historic sites, and developing a deeper understanding of how they can affect positive change in their communities and their nation. Thank you for the opportunity. This is great for me. I feel privileged and special to have people who are interested in me and who invested time and money for me to be here. Like all of our programs, R2L Next Gen is made possible thanks to the generous support of our donors, like our founding sponsor, State Farm. Our support of CHCI's Ready to Lead Next Gen program reinforces the commitment that State Farm has to young people their families, and our communities. The 2014 application will be available online in January. To learn more about R2L Next Gen and its application requirements, please visit us at chci.org slash R2L Next Gen. The CHCI Ready to Lead or R2L is an intensive one-day program that provides 9th and 10th grade Latino high school students with the tools and training necessary to prepare for college. The program is held on various college campuses across the country in cities with a high Latino population. Ready to Lead helps more Latino high school students enter higher education by educating them on the college planning process, motivating them to complete high school, and empowering them to serve and lead in their communities. R2L's goal is to instill the belief that a college education is achievable. Ready to Lead's comprehensive workshop sessions include college planning, financial literacy and financial aid, leadership development, and the Mentoring Power Hour, an hour-long activity for students to engage in a conversation with mentors, many of them CHCI alumni, to discuss their personal success stories and insight on how to create their own. Like all of our programs, Ready to Lead is made possible thanks to the generous support of our sponsors, like State Farm. State Farm believes that for communities to thrive, young people must be empowered as leaders and decision makers to address real issues and challenges. This program has helped me feel more confident and ready to lead. To learn more about CHCI's Ready to Lead, visit us at chci.org slash r2l. And don't forget to like us on Facebook at CHCI's Ready to Lead. Here to begin our program is Laura Vasquez, Senior Immigration Legislative Analyst, Immigration Policy Project for the National Council of La Raza, and CHCI alumnus representing the 1989-2000 class of CHCI Fellows. Good afternoon. I hope that you have been enjoying all of the great sessions so far today. While the discussions have been phenomenal and the participants engaging, none may be more timely than what we are about to take on this afternoon. This session will address the very important topic of immigration, and for the first time in CHCI's history, we are proud to have five U.S. Senators on our conference stage. If that wasn't enough, we also have five members of the House of Representatives. Before we jump in, let me just tell you a little bit about my CHCI experience. About 14 years ago, I came to Washington, D.C. with the goal of learning about public policy and the desire to improve conditions for immigrants in the United States. CHCI opened a world of opportunities for me. I met incredible advocates who I admired and learned from. I was also fortunate to meet an incredible group of Latino leaders who were part of my cohort and who I call friends to this day. With my class and the CHCI alums that I have met over the years, I have continued to appreciate the incredible work that CHCI does in bringing Latinos together who are passionate about increasing opportunities for our community. I am indebted to CHCI for the experiences it provided during my fellowship that gave me a foundation to start my career as an advocate for immigrants. 
I went on to be a congressional caseworker and worked with individuals who were trying to navigate the bureaucracy of our immigration system. For example, I had to tell people that even though their application to be reunited with their loved one had been approved, there was no visa available and they would have to wait years to get one. I also remember meeting an undocumented Irish man, a constituent who came into the office with his US citizen wife and wanted help adjusting his status. He had lived in the US for years, had fallen in love, and it fell on me to explain to him how our broken immigration system would, uh, could lead to him being separated from his wife for 10 years before he could adjust his status. It is because I was able to interact with so many individuals from all walks of life who were impacted by our broken immigration system that I continue to advocate for reform. And I am hopeful that because of the strong champions in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, we can have immigration, an immigration system that is in the best interests of our country and reflects our values. Of course, we must take a moment this afternoon to recognize our sponsors. And this session is brought to you by SEIU. Thank you to SEIU for your ongoing support of Latino leaders. Now, I would like to introduce an upcoming film that will give all in our community great pride. Directed by Diego Luna, the film Chavez chronicles the birth of a modern American movement led by famed civil rights leader and labor organizer, Cesar Chavez. Torn between his duties as a husband and father and his commitment to bringing dignity and justice to others, Chavez embraced nonviolence as he battled greed and prejudice in his struggle for the rights of farm workers. His triumphant journey is a remarkable testament to the power of one individual's ability to change the system. Let's take a look. Farm workers in Delano, California have begun an unprecedented strike in the Central Valley. The Chavez group are seeking to force the growers to recognize their group as the bargaining agent. I wish they'd all go back to where they came from. So who the hell is this Cesar Chavez? Yeah, I heard he's Mexican. Seems a safe bet. I'm angry that I live in a world where a man who picks your food can't feed his family. We don't need you. Get the hell out Whoa. of our country! Have you seen the headlines? That's costing us real money. We don't have to negotiate. We have to dictate terms. We have no laws to protect us here. With the boycott, there are no laws to stop us. This is the moment, Caesar. This is what we came here to do. You can't oppress someone who's not afraid anymore. Okay, are you ready for the panel? Yeah. Here to lead us in the first hour of discussion is Senator Robert Menendez. He grew up the son of immigrants in a tenement building in Union City, a product of New Jersey's uh, public schools and a graduate of the state's universities. He has served as a school board member, a mayor, and a state legislator. He has long been on the front lines of the immigration debate. Please welcome New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez. Thank well, thank you very much. Bienvenido a Washington. And if Cesar Chavez as an individual could lead a movement that helped farm workers and workers in general be able to achieve justice, we can lead a movement to get a vote in the House of Representatives on comprehensive immigration reform. Let me thank our event uh, sponsor, the Service Employees International Union, and particularly Eliseo Medina, and all of those who work with him who have done such a fantastic job there and helped build support for immigration reform in monumental ways and all of you for participating in this public policy conference. 
Uh, today you're going to hear from those of us who worked together for seven months to write the immigration reform bill that passed the Senate. We are poised for a lively, informative, and necessary discussion to evaluate a pathway forward for reform. And it's timely and fitting that we have this discussion here today during the CHCI's public policy conference, because I believe this year as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, it should be not just a celebration, but a call to action to see the House of Representatives give us an up or down vote on immigration reform. The immigration reform bill that we passed in the Senate is a historic opportunity to finally reform our broken immigration system. It reunifies families. It brings 11 million people out of the shadows into the light. I've always said that immigration reform is the civil rights issue of our time. And the reason I say that is because when I have hundreds of cases in my office, not just from my home state of New Jersey, but across the country in which U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents get unlawfully detained in immigration raids in violation of their constitutional rights, it tells you how, Im how much of an imperative this is. I don't know about you. But I don't want to be a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident and be a second-class citizen in the United States, and that's why immigration reform is the civil rights issue of our time. Now, it's not just Latinos who care about reform, but we do make up two-thirds of the 11 million people living and working in the shadows unable to fully participate in American life. So this is an issue that we need to address for our community, but also for the country. Now, passing a bill in the Senate, as you'll hear from my colleagues, required some compromises in order to be able to achieve the ability of what we got, which is a strong bipartisan vote. Everyone, however, I think should be aware of certain elements of this bill as we approach this discussion. The Senate bill creates a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants currently living in the United States, and it includes the best DREAM Act provision ever offered under any piece of legislation. Reforming our immigration system is a economic imperative as well. And that's not just because those of us or the Gang of Eight who put the legislation together believe that is true. It's because the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan division that scores everything that we do in the United States Congress as to whether this legislation is going to cost money, is it going to save money, here's what they said. After looking at our legislation, it said it will cut the deficit by nearly $900 billion dollars to 2033. That's nearly a trillion dollars less, less of debt on our nation's back and the next generation of not only Latinos but Americans. It will grow the economy at 3.3 percent in the first 10 years, 5.5 percent in the second 10 years. Imagine that type of growth in the economy if we were experiencing it today, creating jobs for all Americans. It would add, according uh, to these studies, 121,000 jobs a year for 10 years, or 1.2 million jobs. And finally, it said it would raise the wages of all Americans, not just undocumented who would now be able to obtain new jobs, but it would raise the wages of all Americans. Few things that we do in the Congress can achieve all of those goals at the same time. But finally, there's some lesser known provisions that I think are important for us as a community. Protections for domestic violence survivors, asylum seekers, refugees, detainees, children who are separated from their parents. And it increases oversight of an enhancement of the training of the Border Patrol agents, creates a mechanism that allows border communities to meaningfully share their input, has prohibitions against racial profiling. So in addition to that, the plan ultimately reduces backlogs in the family and employment visa categories and includes strong measures that will keep families together. And for the first time, if you're a legal permanent resident, you have an undocumented spouse, you'd be able to reunify immediately with that individual under our law. So this bill is really, those are just some of the elements a comprehensive solution that enhances human rights protections, not just for the millions of undocumented who will be new Americans, 
but also for many others who have languished under the system. Now, uh, I believe that if this bill, even as it is today, was put on the floor of the House of Representatives and given an up or down vote, that it would pass with bipartisan votes. So our challenge, as you'll hear from some of my colleagues, is to send a message to the House of Representatives to follow what we did in the United States Senate and to have a vote on this critical issue. If we have that vote, we will be on our way to the president's desk who is ready and willing to sign it. Let me uh, introduce uh, to you uh, some of my friends and colleagues who ultimately were a critical part of making this happen. First of all, the leader on the Democratic side of the Gang of Eight. He is an ardent New Yorker, a man that has been dedicated in his congressional tenure to give voice to the voiceless. Senator Schumer is a legend for his advocacy of the immigrant community. And while no one else thought we could get 51 votes, we got 68 to 32. Senator Chuck Schumer. The leader on the Republican side of the gang of eight is someone who I've come to greatly admire. Uh, some may call him the maverick of Arizona, a man who has pushed for immigration reform countless times and who is not afraid to read acro reach across the aisle to do what is in the best interest of the nation. As a border senator, he knows the pressing economic and moral issues why immigration needs to be changed, and he has used his personal political capital to make this a signature issue that we see we seek to be signed into law. Senator John McCain of Arizona. One of my colleagues who uh, is widely recognized as a pragmatic, innovative, and independent thinker driven by a deep-seated obligation to create more opportunity in the next generation than that which he is part of. Uh, each of us have stories of how we came to this country. Senator Bennett's began in Poland. His mother and grandparents arrived to this country after surviving the Holocaust. America gave them hope and the opportunity to rebuild their lives, and that's why he understands why immigration reform is so important. He led in our efforts on the agricultural provisions of the law, which gives professional farm workers temporary legal status and the right to earn a green card in the future by continuing to work in agriculture. Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado. Senator Bennett. And then uh, a gentleman who has been the driving force on many developments in immigration reform over the last several years, but he is best known as the original author of the DREAM Act and has advocated for more protections for American workers who can find themselves in competition with other high-skilled foreign workers for jobs. There are two things that Dick Durbin consistently pressed in these negotiations. How do the dreamers realize their dream, and how do we protect American workers? And there was no stronger voice for that than Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. Senator Durbin. So now I'd like to invite, in the order that I introduced them, uh, for about four minutes apiece to make some opening remarks and then we have a couple of questions that we're going to share with the entire panel in the audience and I'll start off with you Senator Schumer. Thank you. Thanks Bob. Well thank you very much Bob Menendez and let me say I can tell you time after time in that little room where the eight of us gathered there was someone who drew a line in the sand and said I will not budge unless our immigrants are on a path to citizenship, every single one of them on a fair and reasonable path to citizenship, and it's one of the main reasons that we are here today, our chair today, Bob Menendez, who does a great job. As does every one of our colleagues on the Gang of Eight, I also want to make uh, one more acknowledgement. Um, someone who is with me here today started out as a CHCI, had a CHCI fellowship and she worked for Saul Ortiz. I remember Saul, I served with him in the house. We saw how good she was. 
She started off as an LC in my office and has been promoted and promoted because she is so good. And her fellowship gave her great initial training. She's now the legislative assistant for health and education, one of the major positions in my office. Uh, Veronica Duran, where is she? Okay, I'll be brief, and I am sorry I can't stay the whole program, but I'm so honored to be with you here today. The number one question people are asking is not what the bill does or how it can be changed. Those are important questions, but far and away, the number one question people are asking is this. Can we get this bill accomplished? And I truly believe we can. The next panel, the House panel, you'll ask them a whole lot of questions. But because of your work, the work of the entire community, and because we had some really good allies on the conservative side, business, farm growers, uh, high tech, Catholic church, the evangelical churches, we've made huge progress. And when we passed our bill with a large, large majority, with 68 votes in June, the tone in the House was, we're not going to do immigration reform. So we went to work over the summer, and we took a list of 122 House members, Republican, who were not for immigration reform, but might be able to be won over. And we had many of you write them, call them, visit them at their offices, many members of the labor community, the, grow the farm worker community, but also we had many members of the very conservative communities that I mentioned. And they went to them and they said to them how important this was in terms of fairness, in terms of honor, and in terms of America. You want to get your economy going? Immigrants are the answer. And in fact, CBO, a nonpartisan uh, uh, office here that scores things, said that if we passed our bill, as it passed the Senate, the GDP of America would grow 3.5 percent. That's huge. That's more than any spending program Democrats would propose or any tax cut program Republicans would propose. And it's obvious. Why? Because no one works harder than our immigrants. From whatever country they come from, they work so hard. And they are the proudest of Americans. In any case, these people went to work. And just today, the Weekly Standard, a conservative magazine that is not friendly to immigration reform, listed 84 Republican senators who now have said very positive things about comprehensive reform, which of course has a must. It must include a path to citizenship for the 11 million. And so we have real hope. The leadership in the House, Republican, knows that if they keep being anti-immigrant and blocking immigration reform, the Republican Party will be a minority party for a generation. And some of them, to their credit, and I've been talking to them quite regularly now, know that how good immigration reform will be for the economy and future growth of America. Not all of them know that, but some do. And you put all that together, and I believe we can get a bill done. If the House passes a bill that is not exactly as good as ours, but has a way for a path to citizenship different than what we would propose, but still there, we can get together in conference and pass a bill that will make you all proud. So my message to you is twofold. One, this issue is hardly dead. It's alive and well, and it's alive and well for this year. And second, don't stop now. Work as hard as you can on every House member who has not come out for comprehensive reform, and don't let up until they do. Thank you for the honor of addressing you. Thank you for being compadres. And I look forward, I look forward to being with some of you at least when President Obama sits at his desk and signs comprehensive immigration reform into the law of the land. Thank you very much. Senator McCain. 
Well, thank you for welcoming me here as the token Republican today. <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, what a great pleasure it's been for me to have the opportunity to work with these four great senators in my view. It's also a pleasure for me to work under the chairmanship of the Foreign Relations Committee of Senator Menendez, who is a worthy successor to our Secretary of State, John Kerry. And of course, um, if there's ever a person who has carried the torch of the DREAM Act, it is Dick Durbin. And when history is written, Dick Durbin will have a very prominent place in that for his advocacy for these children. And as far as M Michael Bennett is concerned, he brings a voice of reason, a voice of the people of Colorado who are centrist and, and important, con uh, made important contributions. And of course, what can I say about Senator Schumer? You all know him. You know he is one of the most effective members of the Senate. And it's uh, remarkable the job he did in steering us through the many hours of spirited discussion, i.e. insults. Spirited discussions mean you <laughs> insulted each other quite frequently. But we came up with a product. And those who say that Washington is completely gridlocked, I give you the example of the eight of us that there still is ways of getting things done if people really want to do it. <laughs> I viewed one of my primary responsibilities as a member of the Gang of Eight to talk to the business community and galvanize them. And I'd just like to mention to you this, Bennett, this bill would reduce the budget deficit by $850 billion over the next 20 years. This is the Congressional Budget Office, not any of our figures. The legislation would add $300 billion to the Social Security Trust Fund over the next decade. And my own state of Arizona would have enormous benefits from it, including our economic output would be increased by $616 million, and 8,000 more jobs in the next two years would be created. So what I have tried to do is go around my state and, and around the country and tell the business community that there's a lot at stake here. And the best way for us to get out of this rather stagnant economy we, ha we are in is to pass comprehensive immigration reform. There's only one other aspect of this that I'd like to discuss with you, and that is the, the humanitarian side of it that perhaps we don't talk about as much as we should. Today, uh, the temperature down on the border now, now that summer is over down in the Arizona-Sonora border is probably down into the 90s. It's been up in, well into the hundreds ever since May. And the Border Patrol or the local sheriff will stumble across some bodies in the desert. And those bodies will be unidentified and they'll be taken to the morgue and they'll be given a decent burial. But those bodies are there because people wanted to come to this country for a better life. The same reason why all of our forebears did the same thing. And yet, we have not been able to secure the border efficiently, which we can do, but also understand that if we do not give the people, the 11 million of them that are now living in the shadows, uh, it, the chance the opportunity to do the same thing that our forebears were able to do, and that is have a path to citizenship, then we're going to have 11 million people living in the shadows and being exploited and abused because they don't have the protections of our Constitution and our laws. As a Judeo-Christian principled nation, we should not let that happen. We should not let that happen. If there's someone here who has never broken a law, please raise your hand. I can't. And people broke the law when they came to our country. But they're going to pay a very heavy price on the path to citizenship. But we should give them that path. And maybe not all of them would choose that path. But they should have the opportunity to live and raise a family and have a job and enjoy the benefits of the greatest nation on earth. That's really what this legislation is all about. Thank you. Bennett from Colorado, and I, I want to say first, um, 
that I've enjoyed working with these people more than anything else I've done in the Senate. But I want to repeat for you something that I've said in every corner of my state of Colorado. In the four years that I've been in the Senate, I have not seen any expression of legislative leadership greater than that shown by the Republicans that were in this gang of eight, led by John McCain. I say that as a Democrat. John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, Jeff Flake, who sat at that table for seven or eight months knowing what they might hear about what they were doing. And, it, and it's in large part because of them that we were able to pass this bill with almost 70 votes in the United States Senate. And, and it's important to say that because of the times we're living in and the politics that you see going on in this town. Without their leadership, we would have gotten nowhere on this bill. The second, as you may know, we've been having a lot of terrible flooding in Colorado. And I visited a community called Evans, which is outside of Greeley in northeast Colorado a couple of weeks ago, that had been hit by a river that they never imagined would roar through their community. And I visited two trailer parks that had been completely destroyed. And I can't tell you the percentage of people living there that were undocumented, but it was probably over 80 percent. People working in our field, I asked them, we had a conversation, working in agriculture, working in construction, cleaning our hotels, whose only asset was the trailer home that they owned because they couldn't finance it, so they paid cash for it, and now everything's gone. And the federal government can't assist them because they're undocumented. They are part of the fabric of our economy in Northeast Colorado. And that's their community in Northeast Colorado. And it seems to me that we've gone on for far too long having people live in some sort of second class status in the United States. And it's long past time for us to make sure there's a pathway to citizenship. The last point that I, I will make is that you will hear lots of excuses if you hang around this town, excuses that, for why somebody shouldn't support something. They shouldn't vote for something. In this case, you might hear people say, well, even though there were two Republican senators from Arizona who care more about border security than almost anybody else in the Senate, that somehow there's not enough border security in this bill. Or excuse after excuse after excuse. And what I want to leave you with is just this thought. This bill, if it passes, will be a very strong reaffirmation of two ideas that makes America a special place. One is that we subscribe to the rule of law. And the other is, unlike any other country in, in the world, we truly are a nation of immigrants. When you hear people making excuses about the bill, I hope you'll push them into, into it. Because I know how hard these guys negotiated for so long, for th that seven or eight month period, a work product that's that, that, that's the best work product that I've seen since I've been in the Senate. So don't let people put you off with their excuses, and don't let this bill fail in the House, because if we do, uh, it'll be, it may be the last time in this generation that we're going to have a chance to get this right. So thank you in advance for everything you're going to do, and thanks for having me here today. My first thanks to uh, Bob Menendez. He's one of these key players. He doesn't engage in every aspect of the conversation. When he speaks up, you listen. And many times he'd admonish the rest of it. Listen, I've sat there and listened to all of you for a long time, Bob would say. I've got something that's very important. Pathway to citizenship was critically important to Bob Menendez. Bob, thank you for your leadership in this whole effort, and thank you for your continued leadership in the Senate. Chuck Schumer's my roommate for 22 years. Go figure. And uh, as chairman of the Immigration Committee, subcommittee, he was really the leader in helping us put this together. But he couldn't have done it, and I'm sure he would acknowledge, without the partnership of John McCain. John McCain stepped up, and because he did, we are here today. Thank you, John, for your leadership on this issue for many, many years. Michael, Benton, Michael Bennett took up many issues, but the one on agriculture was one that was so challenging. He and Senator Dianne Feinstein really worked overtime to make that work well. So thank you, Michael, for everything you've done. Let me just, let me just say very briefly, if you were a student of history, and I am, always learning, but a student of history, and you look at the great social movements in the history of America, 
whether we're talking about the emergence of African Americans or women or the disabled, take a look at those movements and you'll find one recurring theme, the involvement of young people. Young people who become a critical part of the energy behind these changes in America, in our law, in our culture, in our politics. It's their idealism, their energy, and their courage. It's something I learned a long time ago. I didn't know at the time when I introduced the DREAM Act 12 years ago where it would be today. When I introduced it in Chicago, I used to go do some meetings. And it was never a surprise that after the meetings, in the dark, out by my car, would be standing one or two young people, sometimes with tears in their eyes. And they'd look over their shoulders in both directions, and they'd say, Senator, I'm one of those dreamers. They were frightened. They had been raised to be frightened, worried that the speeding ticket or the wrong decision here, there, or the other place would lead to their deportation and the deportation of their family. That's what they lived with every day, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But time passed and things changed, and the dreamers came out of the darkness and came out of the shadows and said, America, this is who we are. These are our lives. These are our dreams. This is our vision of the future of this country and our vision of our own future. And with that emergence of these young people in this comprehensive immigration movement, things changed dramatically. Dramatically. I can recall the galleries filled in the United States Senate when, sadly, the bill lost, filled with dreamers and caps and gowns trying to make it clear what they were aspiring to, education, achievement. They become such a critical element in this whole debate. Sometimes they get under the skin of senators and congressmen when they're a little bit too pushy in their offices. John, do you remember that? I bet you do. And I hear about it. They used to come to my office, for goodness sake, saying, come on, Durbin, do something. But this bill, this comprehensive immigration reform bill, has the strongest DREAM Act ever written in the last 12 years. This will give to literally millions of dreamers a chance a chance to be part of America's future as citizens of the United States of America. We used to come together and we'd have for eight months these debates among ourselves over the hot issues. And the time came for the DREAM Act, and I remember it well. I said, well, here's my proposal for the DREAM Act. And my seven Senate colleagues said, fine, we take it. It was the shortest meeting we ever had. They were all committed. Now we've got to keep that commitment. And we have to understand this too. There are some people that just want to pass the DREAM Act. Please, let's do the DREAM Act. We'll get to the other things in the next generation. What the dreamers tell me and what I believe, this is not just about the dreamers. It's about their families, too. It's to make sure that they all have this chance to realize the American dream. So that's been an important part of it. As Bob mentioned, I worked also for this aspect of giving American workers the confidence that when this bill passed, they'd still have a chance for jobs. And when we announced this bill, I looked behind me, and not only did we have the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but the head of the AFL-CIO endorsing this bill. I think we achieved that. The last point or two I'd like to make is this. You cannot be from the state of Illinois. You cannot represent the city of Chicago. You cannot bring up the issue of immigration without two words. Luis Gutierrez. He is going to be on your next panel. More than anyone I know, more than anyone I know, Luis has committed himself to comprehensive immigration reform. He has been a strong voice, sometimes getting under people's skins, but a strong voice to make sure that this moves forward. My last entreaty to you is please let us not miss this opportunity. Let us keep that dream alive for the dreamers and for everyone else. Let us turn to those in the House who think maybe we'll wait till another Congress and say no. It has to be done, and the sooner the better. The longer we wait, the tougher it will be. Let's have it done in the House as we did in the Senate in a bipartisan, solid way, affirming that we are, in fact, a nation of immigrants and proud of it. Thank you. Well, we have another panel that's going to follow us, which are members of the House of Representatives, led by uh, Congressman Gutierrez, who I'll introduce shortly. But we have uh, one or two questions we want to ask our colleagues here. 
One is, what do, I, I think we've all referenced elements of this, but what do we expect as a result of immigration reform? And maybe share with the audience some of the trade-offs that we had to uh, be able to give, which has been the subject of uh, uh, some concern by, by some in order to achieve a, a 68 vote, two-thirds, over two-thirds threshold in the Senate. But what do we, what do we look to achieve through it? Anyone? John, you want to talk about the, some of the elements that well, you've been pursuing? We've, we've been very respectful to our colleagues in the House. We've not, they, they know that we're all snobs, and so we're always very careful to, to be very respectful uh, to them. And I have uh, talked a lot with members of Congress and have told them that we understand their concerns. What we would like to do and our goal is is to get a bill to conference. And we believe that we can make the appropriate agreements with the fundamental of a pathway to citizenship that Bob Menendez would kill me if we ever abandoned that uh, principle, but there's many ways of getting there. Our, our proposal, as hard fought as it was and as difficult it was to get there, we, it's not engraved in stone. We're willing to look at other proposals as long as we preserve the fundamentals that are so important to comprehensive immigration reform. So um, I, I'm guardedly optimistic that and, and I'd like to just say one other word as a Republican. I'm a proud Republican. I'm a proud Reagan, conservative Republican. But I am convinced that if we don't pass this legislation, we will never be on a level playing field with the Hispanic voter. I don't think if we pass it, it would change one single vote. But if you're a politician and you look at the numbers, if there isn't a, a, a pl level playing field where we can compete for Hispanic votes, there won't be if we don't pass this legislation. Now, the first reason why I'm for it is because it's the right thing to do and the United States of America should live up to its reputation and its heritage. But I also speak as a Republican that I think that it's very important that as a party we understand the power and the strength of the Hispanic voter, which is fine. It's what America is all about. I would say that uh, I agree with everything John said, um, and we don't, and we're open to other people's suggestions, and the way they do it in the House may be very different. But I think one of the things we came to see when we were doing the bill is how interrelated so many of these issues are. And we had to make all kinds of trade offs, whether we're talking about low skilled visas, there's a trade off between having people that could come into the country to be able to supply labor, but on the other hand, wanting to make sure that no American workers were displaced. Similar issues that we negotiated around the agriculture provisions of this bill as well. It's the first uh, immigration bill that, that has had both the farm workers and the growers uh, endorse it. That's never happened before. That's very important. Just as Chuck said, it's the first uh, bill that the AFL-CIO and the Chamber have supported. And you can go online and see all the other supporters. Every part of this bill matters to somebody. And I think, that's, I think people are going to find that these moving parts work very well together, and there's a reason to try to keep them together, uh, at least in the final product that we produce, which reflects the way it is in, in, the, in, in my state, which is a typical state, I think. We've got a set of concerns that the farmers and ranchers have, a set of concerns the immigrant rights community has, a set of concerns high tech has, even our ski resorts, believe it or not, have. And it makes sense to, to try to take care of all of that at once, as long as we're taking the trouble to actually get something done in a broad bipartisan way. I'm a liberal arts lawyer, but I want to talk about genetics for a minute. The genetics of immigration. Those men and women, your mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, who picked up and came to this country were special people. There was something different about them from all their neighbors and friends. They were willing to risk everything to come to the United States of America where perhaps they didn't even speak the language and to start brand new, bring their children and start brand new and start at the bottom and work night and day so their kids would have another chance, better chance in life than they had. 
That's my family story. My mother was an immigrant. Here I am, a United States senator. That's in the genetics and DNA of this America, this immigrant America. I was invited recently to St. Louis to speak to the Chamber of Commerce on immigration. The introduction was they had just analyzed the economy of the city of St. Louis and couldn't understand why they were lagging behind the rest of the Midwest and they finally concluded not enough immigrants. Not enough immigrants. Hmm. They realized that this is a powerful driving force, not just a labor force, but also a force for achievement and opportunity. And that's what I think is really going to happen with comprehensive immigration reform, as it's happened generation after generation. Make these folks who are now hiding in the shadows legal. Give them the opportunity. Give these kids a chance to finish college, and you're going to see this spurt of economic growth, the spark that has made America what it is today. So that's my genetics course, but that's what I think this bill is all about. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, when we were debating this, you know, some people talk about security, and that certainly was important. But you can't know who is here to pursue the American dream versus who might be here to do it harm if you have millions of people in the darkness, unregistered with the government, not knowing uh, who is here. So the bill is about national security. You don't uh, actually meet the economic consequences uh, of continuing the present system unless you ultimately create reform. And as we've all talked about the numbers of the Congressional Budget Office, but in real terms, as I've traveled the country, I've heard from uh, a whole score of different industries who said we need you know, this incredibly important human capital to be able to achieve. So in the hospitality industry, for example, you can't have the hotel manager, you don't have the chef, and you don't have the maitre d' if you can't clean a room in the hotel. Nobody's going to want to stay there. And on the flip side of that, at the other end of the spectrum, you have some of the most significant high-tech companies in the nation who say we need the human capital among the best and the brightest, both among those dreamers as well as others, to be able to be at the cutting edge of the curve of intellect and to be able to compete globally. So we look at the legislation from security, from economy, from preserving our, our nation as a nation of immigrants and honoring that, preserving the rule of law, uh, but also promoting growth and opportunity. And I think we all believe that we achieved that. One final question for my colleague, which is really, in my mind, the most important question of the day. And Senator McCain referenced that we respect our House colleagues. We certainly do. But we also want to vote uh, at some point. And what I would like to hear from my colleagues, who obviously all have members of the House of Representatives from their respective states, as I do, uh, how do we get <coughs> to that vote? What is it that needs to be created? What environment in the House needs to be molded so that we can have that moment that can have a vote in the House, which I believe can move us on to the final path uh, towards a conference that can then be reconciled and lead to a presidential signature. Anybody want to take that, that question on? Vic? I'll just say you're building a home a brick at a time. We're building this winning majority in the House the same way with individual members of Congress. And many of you work on Capitol Hill or have spent a lot of time there. Don't beg, don't threaten, don't always believe you're right, but we've got to reach out to each one of those members of Congress and look at the people who are backing us up, labor and business, virtually every religious group across America, from the most conservative to the most liberal re religious groups supporting us, lay, you know, all of the different groups that we can turn to and appeal to each one of these members, Democrats and Republicans, to bring them over to our side. I've been heartened. In my state, a couple of the Republican congressmen I didn't think we had a shot at, I do believe we do. And one of the major corporate CEOs did it. He believes in this, and he went directly to these Republican members, and they're on that list of 84 that Chuck Schumer spoke about earlier. So we've got to continue this congressman by congressman. I really agree with, with everything Dick said and don't have much to add to it, except that, um, as John McCain said earlier uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, this is one of those rare illustrations of Washington actually working so far, this immigration bill. And it came with a very large bipartisan vote 
in the, in the Senate. And I think we should continue to remind people of that, that even when they're having these fights about various things, there does seem to be this piece of legislation that has gained a large consensus, a supermajority in the Senate. Uh, and we're open to changes, as, as everybody here has said, but we need to ca capitalize on that momentum, I think. Uh, and then the most important thing is for people to hear from their constituents at home that they want them to pass this bill. And you know, I surprise a lot of people when I tell them that some of the strongest supporters of this legislation are, are, are my Republican farmers and ranchers in Colorado, but they are some of the strongest supporters of this legislation. Uh, and we, we've do, I think we've done a good job of building a coalition, but we have to sustain that coalition. And we have to, we, we, we can't fail, I mean, we simply can't lose interest in this. I know nobody in this room is going to lose interest in this. We've got to make sure that we keep the attention on this, even with all the fights that are going on and all the, in my view, silliness that's going on, and actually insist that the United States Congress, together, the Senate and the House, get this done. But I just mentioned <clears throat> before I get into that border security. We need to have border security. The provisions in this bill will provide it, in my view, and it will be largely through the development and the use of already developed technology for surveillance. And that I am confident that we can achieve. And don't forget that there's still the flow of drugs across the border. There's also the threat of terrorists crossing our southern border as well. So it's not just an issue of pre preventing illegal immigration. It is also the, this incredible issue of drugs, which we got to have a national conversation about, by the way, because there's still a great demand for it. There's going to be a supply when there's a demand. But we also have to worry about the continued threat of people who want to do, come to this country and do bad things. Here's what we have to do to succeed. We have to galvanize the overwhelming majority of Americans who support this legislation. In my state, it's about 70-30. That's usually enough. But the 30 is very galvanized, very angry, very vociferous. They're very uh, committed. We've got to get the 70 percent committed. We've got to have every single small and large business person in my state and across this country engaged and involved because it's good for them. We've got to get our evangelicals that have committed to this. We've got to get the Catholic Church. There should be a Sunday sometime between now and when we pass this bill where that's the only message from the pulpit, no matter what church it is in America. We've, we've got a, a coalition, the likes of which I have never seen, and yet there's not very frankly the kind of enthusiasm and commitment that makes this the number one priority for the business community, for the churches, for the, all the different coalitions that are in support of this legislation. And every time you see a business person, large or small, tell them, ask them what they've done lately for comprehensive immigration reform. Let me ask the audience a question as we close here. And be honest, don't raise your hand if you didn't, which is fine. But how many of you, back in your home state or while you're here visiting in Washington, have spoken to your member of the House of Representatives about immigration reform? Raise your hands. Okay, that's a good number. But there's also a fair number that Shame happens. on the rest of you. Uh, <laughs> and for those of you who have and those of you who haven't, uh, I'm always reminded what Adley Stevenson used to say. He said, when I get the heat at home, I see the light in Washington. Uh, and generating some personal contact with your member of Congress is an extraordinary impact. Some people think they do not. Congressman Hosa, our chair, knows very much, as all of us do, that the personal impact of constituents and groups that you are associated with, affiliated with, whether they be a local chamber of commerce, whether it be your church, whether it be a civic group, is incredibly important. You can make the difference. We met with Speaker Boehner, uh, the Chairman Hinojosa, the members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus a while back. I got the sense that the Speaker wants to get there. But he is constrained by a certain universe in his party that makes it difficult. If we get enough members on both Democrats and Republicans to go to the Speaker and say, we believe that this is an issue, whether I vote for it or not, this is an issue that deserves its vote, so that we can ultimately go to a conference, a jointure of the House and the Senate, 
work out the final details and have one final vote in each of our houses, we will have individually done what Cesar Chavez did in that video, and we will have made history. Thank you so much for joining us today, and please welcome and thank my colleagues who will be leaving. I got to introduce Luis. So, okay. Bob, thanks. All right. Appreciate it. All right, John. Thank you. Now, our next panel is an important one because it's really where the ultimate success of everything we've talked about resides, which is in the House of Representatives. The Senate having voted and sent its package over, this now all resides in the House of Representatives. And so I hope that all of your collective focus will be there and to help mold for us what that focus should look like uh, we have someone who I was privileged to come to 21 years ago in the House of Representatives, someone who I consider a dear friend beyond a colleague, someone who I call the Moses of immigration in the wilderness, going to lead us to the promised land, and someone who, uh, to show you how much he cares about this issue, left a more senior committee assignment in the House of Representatives to a junior committee assignment in the Judiciary Committee, which has jurisdiction over great immigration, so he could help push this as a reality. And that's none other than Congressman Luis Gutierrez of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bob Menendez. Let's give him another round of applause, huh? He is tireless, and he has been there for us during the last two decades. And in the Senate, when there was no one, there was always Bob Menendez. Um, and I'm so thankful to him and his leadership. Uh, where do we begin? Let me try to put it to you this way this afternoon. I think 11 million people should be citizens of the United States so that they can have all of the same responsibilities and duties that I have as a citizen. Fulfill all those same responsibilities, whether it's serving in the military, paying every tax known, and having every responsibility, really. That's why I think, I think we should all be equal. Equal in terms of our responsibilities and in terms of our opportunities. I think we should have E-Verify. So that, I was born in America. I think everybody born in America should get first crack at any job created in America. But then I know there are other jobs that are gonna need to be filled. So I'm pretty verified so that Americans get first crack. And you're saying, well, Luis, is there any other reason? Yes, I'm also for comprehensive immigration reform because I wanna secure that border. I think America should have a secure border, know who enters and leaves. And I think we should have an exit and entry visa system. When somebody comes to visit us, we should know when their time is up. That makes America safer. That's comprehensive immigration reform. And we should also allow people to come legally to the United States. Now, I can tell you that those are all reasons for comprehensive immigration reform. But let me also suggest some other reasons for comprehensive immigration reform because we cannot protect our women in the armed forces of the United States of America. You know it, and I know it. Now, I want you to think about the most vulnerable women working in the fields today and what they have to confront. We can't protect them in the armed forces. They go unprotected in those fields each and every day. We know I want a secure border, but we know the kind of security we have today in our border causes people to die trying to get back to their husband and wives and their loved ones. And so I want comprehensive immigration reform. Somebody's gonna lose a finger, a hand, an eye. They're gonna lose their life today. Because the great thing in America is that workers go to work every day and fewer Americans get hurt and die working. That's a good thing. That means they're being more protected. But as that's happening, Latinos are being hurt more at work and dying more. It's increasing. I don't want people exploited anymore. I want to make sure that we end this travesty. You know, today, what we celebrate, and tomorrow, nos vamos a poner nuestro buenos trajes, huh? 
¿Ah? Vamos a estar muy lindos y vamos a estar bailando, pero van a ver cientos de niños llorando porque mañana van a perder una madre y un padre. Every day, 1,100 people get deported. So I want it for all of those reasons. So let me suggest to all of you that we continue to keep our eye on that prize. Now, I would like to ask, we have the CHCI, and I see Ruben Hinojosa, I know he's here, the chairman. Ah, chairman's right here in the front row, as he always is leading. Please give the chairman a round of applause for this wonderful leadership that he's demonstrating to us. Thank you, Chairman Hinojosa from Texas. I've been with him in the valley. He actually has a center, huh? For Cesar Chavez Center in his, in his district. It's so wonderful to visit there. I would like to welcome uh, the panelists to please come up on the stage and join us, please. Please give them a round of applause. I'm going to introduce them to you. So you just heard from uh, the kids across the hill, right? We're a little rowdier and we're a little less well known. But guess what? The Constitution says that unless we do our job, all the hard work of the Senate and the Gang of Eight and the leadership of Patrick Haley and the Judiciary and Harry Reid and the Majority Leader, all of that hard work goes for nothing unless we in the House get a bill across the finish line. First of all, let me state that Democrats in their hearts are more unified than ever to pass an immigration bill and have it signed by the President. Everyone knows that a bill is forthcoming to unify Democrats, perhaps this week. And I will absolutely be signed on with them to show that Democrats are pushing to move immigration reform forward. But I have also seen unprecedented vocal support from Republicans on immigration reform. I've stood with them in San Antonio and in Chicago and across this country with good men and women from the Republican Party who are for comprehensive immigration reform and care deeply about fixing our broken immigration. I've also known that about a third to half of the Republicans in the House support serious immigration reform and legislation. I will introduce our speakers at the beginning and then recognize each one of them for four minutes to talk initially about where we're at on immigration reform and where we're headed. Then I will pose a few questions and we'll go from there. Now you will notice that in being the moderator, I don't get to make the same sort of opening remarks that they did, but I guess they want to make Luis Gutierrez the moderator so that they can moderate me. Um, so let me say I think that each of these people, as my, I think of each of them as my siblings. We're like quintuplets. <laughs> think about it, we spend nine months together in a secret cramped meeting room, sometimes bickering, often making progress. And now we've emerged into the light of day and we're charting a move forward. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you Javier Becerra. Yeah. He came to the Congress the same year I did and has risen to the leadership position of House Democratic Caucus Chair, a position previously held by none other than the former Speaker, Senator Bob Menendez. He's on the Ways and Means Committee, the first Latino. He was a member of the Budget Super Committee and he's also a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and he is the former chair of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus. Next, ¿qué le puedo decir? Mi amigo. Porque dicen que, tú sabes, Cuba y Puerto Rico son, ¿verdad? Dos alas de un mismo pájaro, ¿verdad? <laughs> and it's true. Um, he's my dear friend and someone who stayed with our group and is continuing to persevere to bring immigration reform. That's none other than Mario diaz Velarde of Florida. Welcome, Mario. He is the Republican quintuplet of the group, and he and I have appeared on Spanish and English television so much together that Univision is thinking about giving us our own telenovela of the odd couple. <laughs> he's a member of the Appropriations Committee, and he's very, very active in his leadership position in the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Gracias, Mario, for joining us. Next, we will hear from Zoe Lofren. She's a leader of the Democrats when it comes to immigration. She was the chair and is currently the ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee so that all immigration issues flow through her committee. But it's not her title, but rather her compassion, her expertise, the quality of the staff she surrounds herself with that makes Zoe Lofgren absolutely indispensable when it comes to immigration reform. Thank you, Zoe, for joining us. 
And finally, we will hear from John Yarmuth of Kentucky. At the beginning of this Congress, the Democratic leader, Nancy Pelosi, in consultation with Javier Becerra, suggested to the group that was forming that Jarmuth join us. They were really smart in picking him. He's white, he's from the middle of the country, but most importantly, he knows how to get things done across party lines on difficult issues like immigration. He was indispensable to the Democratic leader in our party on health care. He's a reformed journalist and newspaper publisher. <laughs> Put the reform in there. So he knows a thing or two about messaging. And he's been in Congress in 2006 and serves on the Budget Committee and recently was chosen by the House leadership to serve on the exclusive Committee of Energy and Commerce. And that is none other than John Yarma. Thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us. Now let me get my paperwork together because I'm going to sit down. Uh, Mr. Chairman of the Democratic Caucus, uh, who we got together in uh, 1993 in the Congress. Uh, Congressman Javier Becerra, you have the floor for four minutes. Please, sir. Can you do it from my ear? No, from your chairs, yes. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone to Washington, D.C. and um, the lights are still on here and that's what's good. Uh, we will continue to work and those of us who believe that this is the moment for comprehensive immigration reform won't stop working either. So we thank you for being here and taking interest in this session. I want to thank the, the leader in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus on Immigration Issues, Luis Gutierrez, for moderating this uh, event and also for all the work that he's done over the years. And with all of my colleagues, this, this almost feels like we should start negotiating right in front of all the people here because this is what we would do. We would get together and have conversations. So no reason why we can't do it now, right? <laughs> let me, uh, let me, actually, let me put it in context. I believe that today, right now, the votes exist to pass comprehensive immigration reform with a pass to, uh, to citizenship in the House of Representatives. And so we must strike now. And while it looks kind of tough, let's remember where we've been. When I got here, and actually, uh, Mario's brother Lincoln had joined Luis and I in 1992 in getting elected, so we both, all three of us, had gotten elected in 1993, sworn in in 1993. I remember when I sat on the Judiciary Committee in 1993, as a member of the Judiciary Committee on the Immigration Subcommittee, it wasn't Alabama and Arizona that were passing these rigid, hurtful laws. It was the state of California. In 1994, we passed the Proposition 187. And so, to see now where California is, from 1993, it's a world of difference. And also, if you look at Alabama, Georgia, Arizona, and you look at California, you can see where they're going to go. We're just trying to say, let's fast forward. Let's not take 20 more years to get there, but we'll get there. So the votes are there now. And that's why it's great that there is still a bipartisan group of members in the House who are trying to get us there. Because it's a matter of navigating. We can get there. Secondly, I think it's important to recognize immigration isn't something we do because we feel it. For many of us, it's very personal. We know families that need this so we don't separate them. The real reason we should do this is because it's good for the economy of the United States of America. Every family in America, especially our middle class families, will benefit if we fix our broken immigration system. The Congressional Budget Office, which is the fiscal scorekeeper, nonpartisan fiscal scorekeeper for Congress when we do legislation, has said, do a comprehensive immigration reform similar to what the Senate did, and you will save the United States of America and the federal budget close to $1 trillion of spending over the next 20 years. That means it's a trillion dollars you can use for other things because you fixed the broken immigration system. So we can do it. But we must do it bipartisanly because there is no way to pass a real fix to the broken immigration system without getting Democrats and Republicans to do it together the way the Senate did. It must be bipartisan. And that's why the group that has been working for several years, and several of my colleagues are here today, really made every effort to try to move forward. And we have a good product that at some point may get to surface. We have to continue to try. So I would say to you that if we recognize that this is good for our economy, 
If we do this in a bipartisan manner, and if we realize that right now we have the votes to get this done, there is no reason why we shouldn't achieve everything we've been wanting for quite some time. And so I close with one last thought. How do you do it? I think all five of us right here could tell you right now. It's pretty simple. We'll be tough because we have to protect our security. We'll be smart. We have a lot of new technology. We have a lot of ways we can do this. But at the end of the day, we have to be fair. And no one in America should believe that we should pass a law that would create a second class of American citizens in this country who would never actually have a chance to become citizens. We can do this. Tough, smart, but fair. And guess what? We have fixed our broken immigration system, which is good for our economy, but good for all those families that are waiting for us to get this done. So thank you very much. Congresista de Florida, Mario, nuestro hermano. Thank you. Let me, before, since Luis Gutierrez is the moderator, he can't say much. Uh, I just want to say something first before my very brief uh, comments. You're going to hear, by the way, a lot of agreement here. Um, Luis, you talked about fairness, and, and you're right, and we all agree on that. I will tell you, however, an equality you mentioned. How do I say this diplomatically? On the issue of immigration reform, on the issue of protecting the most vulnerable, on the issue of never forgetting those who are working day in, day out under very tough circumstances, there is no equality. There is no equality as far as who has been the voice, and all of us have worked hard, but who has been the number one voice, the conscience, the passion of the immigrant community in the United States? Este es mi hermano, but he's my brother because I've seen him fight and nobody. There is no equality release as far as anybody. Nobody has worked harder than you, my friend. Nobody has done more than you. Nobody has tried more than you. Nobody. Thank you, Mario. So now that, now that I get that unequality off the table, um, I will tell you, I, I, you know, in my years here, I got elected in 2002. Uh, you know, you deal with a lot of issues. I'm on the Appropriations Committee. I have uh, never uh, had a more pleasant, a more difficult, a more joyous, a more frustrating uh, uh, issue to deal with than, than, than the relationship that I've developed with these folks here. Uh, we've had disagreements, we've had tough times, we've had, uh, but, but I got to know a group of individuals who are honorable, hardworking, integrity, decency, committed, and with our disagreements and with our agreements, I want you to know that when things get tough, and it gets tough for all of us, right? Uh, and I think, you know, this is tough and everything else, what gives me hope in this process is that I've gotten to know people like these and it gives me hope that even when you have disagreements you can have trust, you can work together, you can do it so quietly without protagonismo. And so what a privilege it has been and it is to be able to now have these individuals as I consider them my dear friends. It doesn't mean that we're not going to disagree and argue and everything else. But, but now, Javier, I agree with what you said. Let me reverse it. You talked about the good that immigration reform will do, and it's absolutely true. But let's flip that over. Let's think about if we don't get it done. And you hear the negatives, right, about the current status. You know, there's you know, millions of people here that are undocumented, so we have a border system that doesn't work. That's true. If you want to fix the border system, you got to pass legislation. We talk about how there are folks that do jobs that Americans won't do. And, and yet the system is such that there's no real legal, legal system to do that. If you want to fix that, you've got to pass legislation. It doesn't work for our economy. You want to fix that, you've got to pass legislation. So whatever you're looking at, the problems that we have right now, and there are multiple problems with the current system, with the fact that there are people here that are undocumented, with the fact that we don't know who comes in and who leaves, that's all under the current system. And when people talk about, well, we don't want to give amnesty to the folks that are here, the current system gives amnesty to the folks that are here. De facto amnesty. So we have to fix a system that is 
absolutely broken for our national security interests, for our economic interests, for everything, for the rule of law. And the only way we're going to do it is to, and it has to be in a, done in a bipartisan way, is to get together and pass legislation. And I will tell you this, I'll finalize with this, because I'm, I am as optimistic now as I was six months ago, five months ago, four months ago. It's gonna be, we've always said, an ugly path. It's gonna, we're gonna have bad days and good days. I think we have a very good opportunity to get it done. And I'm convinced that if, and I think when we get it done, a lot of it is gonna be because of the efforts, the hours and days and years that this group has put together and, and the staffs um, to give us a way forward. So uh, what a privilege it is to be with all of you. Thank you, thank you all. And, I, and, I, and also thank you, uh, Chairman Hinojosa, for putting this together, of course. Thank you. <clears throat> so many of you know that when I arrived here 20 years ago, I joined the uh, then banking uh, committee. Today it's a, um, an exclusive committee, right? It's one of the important committees, uh, more important committees in the Congress of the United States. And I left that committee this year, as Senator Menendez shared with you. But I left that committee to join Zoe Lofren. Uh, she is former chair and currently ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee. Yeah, I joined the Joint Judiciary, but it was order. The only way to, was to get a judiciary so I could be with Zoe, because I wanted to work under her leadership. Please welcome her again. And you have four minutes, Zoe Lofren, for your opening comments. Thank you very much. You know, I. Um I find myself in the senior democratic position on the uh, immigration subcommittee, but my uh, experience with immigration law goes back a long ways. Uh, a long time ago, I practiced as an immigration lawyer. I taught immigration law at the University of Santa Clara. And I have seen immigration law become increasingly dysfunctional over the decades, to the point where it really doesn't work uh, for any sector of our economy. I come from Silicon Valley, where nearly half of the residents of Santa Clara County were, are Americans by choice, Americans born in another country. And yet, we uh, have a problem where hotshot engineers who have just graduated from Stanford are forced uh, to return home. I know that uh, we are dependent on farm workers who come from other countries. And yet, you know, we have about a million and a half migrant farm workers. We have 5,000 uh, visas a year for those workers. So who set up this dysfunctional system? The Congress did. I run into uh, American citizens who are married to uh, husbands or wives born in another country, and they can't get their uh, spouses legalized. This doesn't work for business. It doesn't work for families, uh, and it's dysfunctional. So we need to make the reforms that are necessary that work for America. I know that we can do that. You know, when we started getting together as a bipartisan group over four years ago, it was an experiment. We didn't know if we could come to an agreement. Sometimes there were 25 people meeting secretly in the Capitol, hours on end, trying to see if we could come to an agreement. And what we found was that, yes, actually we could. We could come into a sensible agreement that would reform the immigration laws that very conservative people could support and people who aren't conservative could support. The question is, can we now move that forward to change the law? And there are plenty of Republicans who want reform, and there are, I would say, almost all the Democrats in the House want reform. The question is, what will be put on the floor for a vote? Because I agree, if we put the Senate bill on the floor for a vote, it would probably pass. We actually wrote a bill as a bipartisan group. If we put that bill on the floor, it would probably pass. If we put some small piece on the floor that it would allow us to conference um, with the Senate, that would likely pass. So the real issue is, is there space, time, and motivation uh, by the Republican leadership because they make the decisions on what bills are voted on to move forward? I hope there is, and I have every reason to believe that there is, but I also think it's up to all of you to have your voices be heard uh, because we are uh, a representative democracy, and although people don't always realize this, 
one of the most important voices is the voices of our bosses, which is you. We go for a rehiring decision every other year. It's called an election. And so if you want action, demand it. Uh, the excuse that there's not time is just not a valid one. I mean, we, we name post offices every week. I'm sure we could spare some time for this uh, bill. That we uh, couldn't have a, a consensus. Well, that's just not correct. I know that we can. Uh, that um, we need to slow it down and be more thorough. Give me a break. We have looked at this for decades. We know what we need to do. We need to allow 11 million people who responded to the help wanted sign that was right next to the no trespassing sign at the southern border to get right with the law. We need to make sure that families can be reunited, that American businesses can thrive. And uh, there's no excuse for not doing that. Our economy will uh, be boosted by that. But more than that, our American future will be secured. When you think of all the things that we like about America and American character, it's people who are entrepreneurial, people who are optimistic, people who are risk takers, people who believe in their future and in their families. Every one of those characteristics is what immigrants are about. And our future, our country was built by immigrants. If we don't allow immigration to flourish in the future, we will cripple America's future. So I look forward to working with my friend Mario and others um, to get that consensus. I know that we can do this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saul. <laughs> Let me take a moment to say that uh, we were huddled for all those months together. There were eight of us. To, I don't always agree with the Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives and the decisions they made. Uh, but when uh, Javier and Zoe and I needed a fourth partner, uh, I think that Javier and the, um, uh, speaker, uh, speaker, I'm sorry, Leader Pelosi um, made a wonderful decision, a wise decision, because they brought somebody who wins among the eight as just the nicest guy in the room, and he's the one that really uh, was a real cement and glue to our room, uh, to our group. Thank you so much. Please uh, welcome again. Congressman Yarmouth from Kentucky. Thank you. Congressman, four minutes. Please. Thank you, Luis. Well, and I also brought the bourbon to the meeting. That's true. So it's <laughs> and, and I was pretty much the only one who drank it. But uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's an honor to be here uh, with you. And it's an honor to be, as, as Mario mentioned, it's, it's, it's been such an honor to be part of this group. It's been one of the most productive uh, experiences in my uh, now seven years in the House, and, and it's, uh, it has proven that you can reach across the aisle, we can actually can come to an agreement and make policy the way that I think every American would expect it to be made, which is you give and take, you say, would this work? Well, if we do it that way, I lose these people. No, well, how about this way? Well, I can work with that maybe. I mean, just normal human interaction. And again, I think a process that did engender a great deal of trust. Now, everybody asks me why in the world I am part of this group. Louise said, I'm white, that's true. Um, and I say, well, first of all, Kentucky is a border state. Now, that was during the Civil War, but we, we, were, <clears throat> we, we are a border state. But more importantly, we have, uh, my district is, is Louisville, Louisville. Uh, that's all I have, and, but Louisville is right now the city with the fourth fastest growing immigrant population in the country. Uh, so we are a welcoming city and we are becoming a very, very diverse city. Uh, Kentucky obviously has a very large agricultural sector, but most importantly we have the number one thoroughbred breeding operation in the, in the country. That's a huge industry in Kentucky and it would not function without immigrant labor right now. So we have lots of reasons to be for immigration reform or to be concerned about it. Uh, but I would say probably the reason I am wanted to be part of this group was, first of all, 100 years ago, this year my grandfather came from Russia. You know, he started a kosher butcher sh shop in Passaic, New Jersey. He had a son who went on to become a very successful businessman. And he had me, and now here I am in the Congress. And the beauty of that is not that my story is special, it's that it's very ordinary. It's very common. 
And we all know, everybody up in this, uh, on this stage and everybody in this room has no similar stories or is living them. So that's a, a critical part of my interest. And secondly, because the most enjoyable thing I do as a member of Congress is go to naturalization ceremonies. And I'll never forget one, I saw a friend of mine just mulling around with his three kids one day before the ceremony started, and I, his name's Michael Francisconi, obviously an immigrant. And he, I said, do you know somebody who's being naturalized today? And he said, no, I just wanted my three sons to see what it means to be a citizen. And I said, wow, isn't that incredible parenting? Really significant. So for all sorts of good reasons, I'm part of this group. I'll just make a couple of observations. Going last is, is commonplace for me with the name that starts with Y. <laughs> and, uh, and I did get to hear all of the senators, so it's very hard to say something different. But I am one of those who is also incredibly optimistic. And when I'm out talking about this, people say, well, I just hear there's no chance at all to get it. So we do have a context of negativity out there, or skepticism, I guess, that we have to overcome. We're all very optimistic, but the world isn't. But I'm optimistic for two reasons. One is, there has never been a more diverse, varied group of supporters for a policy, a national policy, than there is lined up for comprehensive immigration reform. When we have the growers and the farm workers, when we have AFL-CIO and the U.S. Chamber, of commerce agreeing, we have the high tech industry, we have the clergy, we have the law enforcement. Uh, there's virtually nobody organized against uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And that's reflected in the polls as well. Virtually everywhere across the country, even in Kentucky, a relatively conservative state, support in the high 60s, low 70s for comprehensive reform. And probably the most significant factor is there is no money on the other side of this issue. Um, there's nobody out there ready to spend $100 million to defeat comprehensive immigration reform. In fact, all the money is on the side of pushing it. And just a couple weeks ago, we met with Mark Zuckerberg yes. from Facebook, and he's, he's recruited, a, raised part of, a lot of it his own money, but he's raised $50 million to run ads supporting people who are running, who, who will support comprehensive immigration reform, and to pressure people who may be on the fence. And, and I think the most compelling thing that he said in that when we met with him was that he, he raised this from his buddies in the high tech industry, but he said, they didn't give money to, for this cause because of economic reasons. They gave it because of humanitarian reasons. Mm -hmm. and, that's really significant. So again, I think the stars are aligned for us to get this done. I, we do have this, uh, this skepticism out there as to whether we can, and we do have the mechanics of the house which are not going to make it easy. But um, again, I think with uh, the energy and passion of so many people, those of you in this room and others, that uh, we, can, we can get this done during this Congress and the country will be far better off for it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you all see why he's important to this process. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then hopefully there's time we'll be able to go out to the audience and get some questions from them. So I'm going to go back to um, Javier, my friend from, uh, from California. Um, um, how critical is the issue of citizenship to immigration reform? Is it important to you that all 11 million undocumented be given a path to citizenship? There's been discussion about um, without a path to citizenship, a legalization program, maybe giving the dreamer citizenship, but they can't like sponsor their parents. How important is that, Javier, to the immigration debate? Luis, I think, um, I, I don't think it would be just someone who is the son of immigrants who would say this. I, I think you can go out to any part of the country and people will say this to you. What we don't want is to relive the days when we tried to keep people in a different class. There were times when we, by law, restricted people's freedom and said to them, you can be in this country, but only if you were owned by someone. And we left those times. It took a long time before those Americans had a chance to really have rights. 
And today, even today, we still see how folks fight for those rights. So I, I got to believe that in America today, the people are way ahead of the politicians in saying, if you're going to fix the system, fix it right, which means if you want someone to have a chance to stay here legally, they should have a chance to become lawful permanent residents, which means the green card, which then gives them a right to become citizens. So there should be a path to law lawful status, but the path shouldn't have a closed door after some form of lawful status. It should allow people who earn it, who prove that they uh, have done everything right, paid our taxes, obeyed our laws, learned our language, it should give them a chance to ultimately become United States citizens of a great country and let them then live that American dream. So I think the American you, people are way ahead of the politicians. So, so um, you're the highest ranking Democrat. Tell us how you feel about the issue. Well, I, I think um, it's enormously important. Uh, and I learned long ago not to say how I'm going to vote on a bill that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> so I don't want to talk about potential legislation. But you can think about it from the point of view of the immigrant. I want to talk about it from the point of view of America. Take a look at countries that have separated out people. And you see it doesn't work that well. You look at Germany, they have Turks who are never able to become Germans and it's caused all kinds of problems in Germany. Look back in our history when uh, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, people who were even born in the United States were not permitted full citizenship or to own property. That didn't work out so well for us either. So I do think it's very important that we embrace our future which is inclusive and people who are coming here becoming Americans. I'll just close with this. I, um, my grandfather was the immigrant, and he was so proud of being an American that he had his natural, I still remember this, his naturalization certificate. It was framed, and it hung in my grandma and grandpa's living room. That passion for citizenship yes, yes. still exists. I went to, on the 4th of July with Sam Farr, a, um, a naturalization ceremony there were citizens of 113 countries at that ceremony. And as they were there taking the oath, they walked out citizens of just one country. That's the genius of America. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I never quite thought about it that way, huh, guys? They all walked out citizens, 113 countries, yeah. citizens of one country. Yeah. Wonderful. Wait, Mario. You know, by the way, I just want to add what, what not only when they walk out are they citizens of one country, but they are as American as our founding fathers. And, and it's a concept that is, we kind of take for granted. Uh, and it's a concept which I think is, we have to cherish. And, uh, you know, you're seeing a lot of agreement here. I think you're seeing, I think it would be very detrimental for the United States of America to have a group of people who, who, uh, you know, go through a process where they get right with the law and then uh, don't share the same rights once they've gotten right with the law that others do. And then there's all the arguments, what does that mean? You know, more rights, less rights? No, no, I think they share, share the same rights. And, and I think everybody would agree with that. And I think it would be detrimental, you're right, to the country, to the country. And a lot of people say, well, you know, how about the rule of law? Well, we can do so protecting that sacred Thing, which is one of the reasons we as immigrants are here, right? Because of the rule of law. We can do that. We can, we can get there. Now, I will tell you how we get there. Uh, there's no magic bullet. I, I, you know, I too don't like drawing lines about what, you know, if you're going to vote for this, you're not going to vote for that until you see it. I will tell you that there is no perfect bill out there, by the way. Whether it's a Senate bill, which has things that I like and things that I don't like. By the way, I commend, however, the Senate for doing their job and getting it done. By the way, even if you don't like parts of it, They've moved it forward. Now, there are millions of people there, Luis, that can't aspire to be citizens. Now, would I then, am I going to say that the Senate bill is unacceptable because, no. There is no such thing as a perfect solution. What we do know, however, is what we have now is the definition of an imperfect situation that can't stand. So I think, uh, uh, like Yarmouth, 
By the way, it's really interesting. I, I, when he got, I apologize for, but, but we're kind of like among friends here, so. Yeah. <laughs> when he got put on the group, I'm like, what the heck, what is this all about? <laughs> like Kentucky, you know, whatever. And I will tell you that it didn't take long to understand I don't agree with Mrs. Pelosi much. I know that's not a secret to all of you. But it didn't take me very long to realize what a wise choice. See, you like her more than you think. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're bipartisan, even then I can agree with her on one issue. Anyways, but, but no, you know, a guy who's like the epitome of common sense, right? Yeah. And, you know, we have these issues, and he, you know, he's not one of these guys that talks a lot, but when he does, it's like, it's like the EF Hutton, everybody's like, whoa, <laughs> you gotta stop to listen. Anyways, so I think we can get there, and I, and I think we can do so. We do have, um, you know, we have some issues that we have in the House. You know, we have the Haster Rule. These are internal issues that we have, you know, on the Republican side that we have to deal with. Um, it, it clearly doesn't make things easier. Um, but I like, I think, what you're seeing up here. Um, no, I think we're more than alive. Okay. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting dance, and I think ultimately we're going to get there, and I think it would be, there are not a lot of, I don't want to draw a, a line in the sand, there are, however, certain things, and I'm not going to say what they are, that if they were in the bill or were not in the bill, I will walk away and say, I'm sorry, no deal. Um, but, but the important thing is to not to draw lines in the sand, not to say that it's got to be this, and if it's not this, it, we're going to go against it because we need the flexibility uh, to get there. The Senate needed flexibility. Remember, they still have millions of people that are not going to be citizens. They needed to make changes at the end. Some we may like, some we may not like. Uh, our process is probably more difficult than the Senate's, but I think we're going to get there. But we're going to get there because there's a group of people who are willing to sit down, even though we disagree on a lot of things, and try to work it out. And I think we're going to get there. It's going to be Thank you. tough, but we're going to get there. Congressman Yarmouth, it's been the ac ac activists out there say, don't have a route to citizenship. The only way we can accept E-Verify and enforcement and so many other things is that. Tell us how, what you've learned and how you feel about it, Dharma. Well, you know, I think just to segue for a minute off what Mario said, one of the things that's important about our product, which I still think is a viable product, is we set out from day one to do two things, to create a product that will work so it'll solve the problems and can pass. So in almost every instance, we were saying, we know that we can't be to the left of the Senate bill on particular matters because it's got to pass a more conservative body. So all along in our six, seven months of work this year, um, Mario and his colleagues were going back to their constituency and vetting this bill with them. And so we know that there can, Republicans can embrace much of what we've done. Even uh, Raul Labrador, whom I talked to the other day, who let, was the first one to leave the group, says he still agrees with virtually all of what we've done and was responsible for writing some important parts of the, the bill. So uh, I think ultimately this product can be the vehicle that um, moves in the House or something very close to it. In terms of the activists, um, you know, I think when I talk to my, member, my fellow members from Kentucky, and they're a pretty d interesting group. Um, every one of them, I've talked to every one of them, the other five others, they're all Republican, and I've talked to four out of the five. All of them are open to voting for comprehensive immigration reform, all of the four. One said, as long as it's the border security piece is strong enough, I can probably go along with the others. The other said, yeah, I want to vote for something. So I, I think we've got a sales job to do, and it's going to be, again, it's going to be the people out in the trenches that make their opinions known and actually and reinforce this interest in, in getting something passed. And uh, so, uh, again, I'm, I'm optimistic like everyone else, but uh, the, the activists are going to be the ones that I think can give, a, give <coughs> the wavering members cover. Thank you. So, uh, bipartisanship. We've talked quite a bit about it here on this panel. Um, obviously, our group worked very hard. Uh, it isn't, as Javier said, maybe in the future the product will be able to be presented. It isn't being presented today. How do you feel about the prospects of a bipartisan? We've all said that the only way to do it is if both sides, so we kind of agree on that. How do you think the future? I mean, the current environment, the government is closed. We aren't getting along. You see the division. How do you feel about bipartisanship 
as it relates to immigration reform and, right. and the likelihood of success? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because, uh, as Mario said, this is a very positive experience, and I think that was uh, felt by all the members. Mm -hmm. In fact, and I won't say who, but one of the members said that, you know, before involvement in this group, he really didn't know any Democrats, and he didn't have anybody that he felt he could trust. And, and you know, if you overlay our voting records, there's very little that matches up. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't work together on something that's really important for the country. Now, the fact that two of our colleagues uh, decided they needed to withdraw is, I regret it, but I don't, I'm not negative about them. And you'll notice that uh, they don't like President Obama, I knew that already, so uh, they, they were not happy about him. But I think the real issue is what can the Republican leadership support? And, uh, um, you know, we could have the best product in the world, but if it isn't put on the floor for a vote, it doesn't matter. Um, so I do think we have, the, the bill is drafted. You know, we could come up with other Republicans to introduce the bill, it doesn't matter unless the Republican leadership decides to put it up for a vote. Similarly, with the Senate bill. I mean, it passed with bipartisan support. It doesn't matter if it doesn't go up for a vote. We could take, and there are certainly Republicans that are looking at what piece of this or that could we purport to, you know, clean up. But that doesn't matter unless that gets a vote. And so uh, I do think that there is a lot more agreement than people suspect. I've talked to lots and lots of conservative Republicans. I work with a lot of the Tea Party guys on um, NSA and privacy issues on, on the Judiciary Committee, and I've gotten to know some of them. We don't agree on this latest budget dust-up, but we talk all the time, and I think there's an opportunity to move forward, but the real issue is whether there's going to be a decision by the Republican leadership. I hope there is. I'm not saying that there isn't, but that's the pressure point, it seems to me. Have you given, given your uh, extremely important position of leadership in the Democratic caucuses as our chairman and your leading role in, in building bipartisanship, tell us how you feel today in the prospects. I actually think Zoe hit it right on the mark. Uh, there are conversations that, if you were to hear them, would lead you to conclude that the, there is bipartisan support for getting this done. And I think just as we see right now with this whole situation with the shutdown of government, we all have to figure out how we're going to get there to a point where we feel comfortable. And in the, in the case of the Republican leadership, I think uh, Speaker Boehner and the Republican leaders in the House have to figure out a way to be able to navigate this, to be able to bring along sufficient number of Republicans and keep sufficient number of Democrats to make this bipartisan. There is a tipping point. At some point, it becomes very difficult politically to sell the bill if it goes too far in one direction. And, and I think the, the difficulty when you're in leadership is you have to figure out how to navigate this for your own party that you, you got elected to be speaker for, as a result of the party, but at the same time, you're speaker now for the entire body. So you have to be able to reach across the aisle to the other side. And so I think the speaker has a, the, the toughest task of all of us. He's got to figure out a way to be able to navigate this to an end point. And that's not easy. Because immigration has never been an easy subject to confront and solve. The good thing is, I think all of us have said, never before have we seen so many stakeholders, so many constituencies supportive of getting this done. And as I said at the very beginning, the people are way ahead of the politicians on this one. They want it done. And so we just have to push and do everything possible to start to close the trap door so no one can escape the fact that we're going to have a vote on the House floor at some point to give us a chance to show that we want to fix the broken immigration system. And hopefully all of us working bipartisan can make this so that the Speaker says, this is a bill that can be put on the floor and ultimately pass on a bipartisan basis. Um, Mario, give us your perspective. Yeah, no, I just, I, I, I don't disagree. One little caveat is that because of, you know, our internal rules, we, the, 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 the Speaker can't really put anything on the floor unless we get the majority of the Republicans to support it. And that's one of the things that we've been working on. And that's why one of the reasons that I feel, you know, I guess it's optimism here is because I think we're going to get there. 
I think we're going to get there. And I think we're going to get there because so much work has been taking place over the years. But by the way, the, the, of this group, but then uh, I may say so. Look, Zoe Lofgren obviously is probably one of the foremost experts clearly in Congress on immigration reform issues. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the work that her and others have done in this group. It's the conversations and the work that goes on every single day. Um, so I feel that we, we're going to get there. And I think if we get the support of the majority of the Republicans, and then we can bring something to the floor. And as Javier said, it's got to be something that if you go you know, too much to one side, you lose all the Republicans, or, or enough that you don't have the votes. Or if you go too much to the other side, you lose uh, Democrats enough, enough to, again, kill the bill. So it is a, a very delicate balancing act. There are very good people working at this, and I think we can get there, which is why one of the things that we keep saying is if we're going to get this done, just mathematically, uh, at least in the House, there's only one way to do it, and that's if you get bipartisan support. And I am um, you know, grateful for all the work that's been taking place in this group, but that continues, and, and individually, and, and, uh, and that's why I, am, I think we have a shot at it. And if I may, just one last, probably changing the subject, so you might want to, but... <laughs> It, it was said that it's very important that the outside groups, that, that the community uh, uh, contact members of Congress. Uh, but there, if I may, you know what they say about free advice, let me give you some free advice, right? Um, there are ways that are effective and there are ways that are not. I will tell you, when I see like, you know, Twitter and you see people who threaten, that turns everybody off. You, you see things, you know, you better vote this way or else, then, you know, one man can feel about that, good about that, but you don't get any support, you don't change any minds. Those of you who have been very effective, and a lot of you here, uh, have been very effective because very calmly, in a very positive sense, you talk about the issues. That's why this group was able to do that. We've had a million disagreements, but it's always, and we've had times where we get, but it's calm and focus on the issue. You threaten, you lose folks. You. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's either this or nothing, and well then, I hate to say it, it's nothing. And so all of us, all of you, all of us have a role to play. Uh, we're going to continue to do our part, and I, and I know that you'll continue to do yours. Congressman Yarmouth of Kentucky, please. Well, I'm not sure I have uh, a lot to add at this point, but uh, again, I think we know because we did it that the bipartisanship is possible. And one of the reasons we were able to do it, of course, is that we did it in secret. And we were not out in the world where the advocacy industry is, <laughs> is taking a shot at everything we do. And then the talk radio world goes off and scares everybody to death. So this is, um, I, I've learned a lot about, you know, as again, you mentioned, I come from the media world. And uh, the media is one of our biggest problems right now in terms of being bipartisan, being allowed to be bipartisan, uh, because we've segmented the country into our separate philosophical silos, and everybody knows, you know, you can, every politician knows you can tell within 15 seconds whether somebody's in the uh, Fox News, Rush Limbaugh silo, or the New York Times, MSNBC silo. Just the whole worldview, the whole jargon, everything is different. In fact pattern. So that's one of the problems that certainly with an issue like immigration reform, which can get very emotional, uh, it's, it, it's very vulnerable to the kind of outside influence that makes it very, very difficult to work together. But we, I, I think that we know that it can be done because we've done it over the last year, and uh, which has got to translate to the larger body. I was given 12 minutes for each of the questions, and we have four minutes, and 50 seconds left. Um, so we've done a good job. So I don't know how you want to do this, but we'll start here, please. Okay. My name is Raul Gonzalez. I'm a teacher, and I'm a, with the California Teachers Association. Good. I'm also the president or the chair of the Latino Teachers in California. And I wanted to, first of all, thank you on behalf of the children of California, especially the undocumented children. But I wanted to take you back to 1986 and Ronald Reagan, our, our president at the time, and the Amnesty Act of 86, one that I benefited from, and my family did as well. And I can just share with you that I am a teacher of 15 years, my brother's a teacher of 20, my sister's a teacher's aide, and my other sister a, 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 a also works in the school setting. I think that the vision that Ronald Reagan had at the time was the potential of the kids and not the potential of the fear or the, or the threat. The potential of these kids to be somebody 
and to be productive in this community. And I hope we would focus on that versus focus on the danger. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see you stood up there. Why don't you, why don't you just, if everybody could keep your comments short, we, we can hear a lot. Please continue. Hi, my name is. And we're going to go to this side. I'm Vanessa Cruz. I'm a PhD political science student at the University of Michigan, originally from Chicago. And I just wanted to thank you for your time here, but also ask you about um, the real threat that is portrayed in the media. And I thought that was a great point that was brought up about the media um, in projecting and criminalizing immigrants, injecting that fear in the audience and in the elected officials, one that's easy to scapegoat on in very racialized terms. So I'm wondering how can we sort of take a step back and redesign the image that people think when they think immigrant. You know, right now it's conflated with thinking Mexican drug cartel, you know. Thank you. I'm going to let everybody think about these questions that are posed mm -hmm. over here on this side, please. Let's, Let's go, go right to the here. other side. Yeah. We'll get a lot more questions and have them as mm -hmm. questions and comments to add to our conversation. Please, Gabby. Gabby Pacheco with The Bridge Project. Uh, we know that today we have the government shutdown and it has a lot to do with the Affordable Health Care Act. And uh, a couple of, actually a year ago, uh, when DACA was announced, without any need, the Obama administration said people who have deferred action and get DACA will not be able to participate in health care. Um, and so to me, what path to citizenship means is being able to have good health care, uh, affordable housing, good education for my family, for my future children. Um, it means so much more than a piece of paper. Um, to me, be, it means being able to serve, being able to um, be called one day to represent in a jury. Uh, and so my question is, what does path to citizenship means to you? Because it seems to be that um, right now, a lot of different people have a lot of different ideas of what it means. OK. Please, in the, OK, keep moving that mic around. Go ahead, you got it. Um, then we'll come back to you. Oh. Let the lady uh, in the back will come to you. Nena Torres, uh, thank you. Uh, Congressman uh, Gutierrez, I'm the uh, executive director of the Inter-American University Program for Latino Research. That's now at the University of Illinois. I'd like to hear from you what you think the president can do to help this. Um, I can't help but think that daily deportations of 1,100, 80% of them having citizens in their families, that that doesn't help you get the job done in Congress. Okay, last question up here. Hello? Oh, yes. Go ahead. My name is Cesar from the Dream Action Coalition, and uh, pretty much a question for Congressman Villar. Um, we're seeing that there is uh, obviously uh, many people, and obviously in, uh, the Gang of Seven and the Gang of Eight in the House, and the being champions on the issue. And there is many Republicans who are of the same opinion and who, who want to get it done. And I think that's something that we are seeing the bipartisan uh, efforts really uh, bearing fruits. Uh, however, there is the whole procedure, obviously, that has to go. But internally, the leadership uh, needs to take uh, action. Whatever that process looks like, we really want to be able to see or what is, uh, like, your efforts are, I'm sure, you know, incredible efforts, but what does that process perhaps look like moving this historic legislation forward? Well, we're, we're running out of time, but why don't we give 30 seconds to each of us? Zoe, you want to start? Give sure. an answer Sure, to and that? I'll, I'll answer that. We, on the Judiciary Committee, uh, the chairman has moved four bills that are just outrageous. I mean, mm -hmm. one of them would make every undocumented person in the United States a federal criminal. No Democrats voted for that. What has been said is that we do piecemeal legislation and that would be the basis for somehow moving forward. Unfortunately, the Judiciary Committee, led by the chairman, has yet to produce any spec that could allow for that to happen. So the decision needs to be made either by Chairman Goodlatte or by the speaker that he's not going to go through the Judiciary Committee to take either the bill we wrote or the Senate bill, which I don't think they're going to do, or some other piece and move it forward. Um, I mean, there are other machinations that occur, but really it's simpler than it would think. It's Thank a you. decision. It's a decision on the part of the Republican leadership on how to move forward. I don't want to you know, bash them. I want to help them. I want to support them in reaching a decision that works. Thank you. So I know how difficult Javier's job is trying to keep this well. <laughs> Javier, but why don't you take a minute, Javier, and kind of 
see what give us your reflection thank you well first thank you everyone for for being so patient and listening to us and i want to once again thank all my colleagues because this has been a fabulous experience to, to try to work this through i believe like mario that we're going to get there and i would just say to you two things we can't let anyone make us believe that we can't get it done because the votes are there and so we just have to keep pushing and I think each and every one of us has a responsibility as members of Congress to prove that we're ready to get this done. And so you keep pushing us in constructive ways. Show that you're a teacher and you benefited from the last time we did something. And that's the image, that's the frame that we hopefully will put out there. But even if you don't, as John said, in Kentucky, two-thirds of the public in Kentucky already wants this done. And so the more we put out the face of what real immigrants are like, hardworking, aspiring, and ultimately helping the next generation become the dreamers of tomorrow, I think we'll be okay. Don't give up. Keep pushing. We'll get it done. John, please. I'd like to address the question of what the president can do. I think probably the best thing he can do is oppose it. <laughs> and... <laughs> Probably. No, I think his role, he's, he's clearly made this one of the, his top priority items for the, his second term. And I think his job really now is he's not going to sell it to the, the country. He's, he, can, he can help keep us together, keep us Democrats together. But again, I don't think he's going he's gonna to be the one who's going to influence Republicans or, or Speaker Boehner to, uh, to move this. So. And uh, Mario, why don't you? Three points, if I may. Number one is, let me, and let me take the question to me directly, and I'm going to use you, sir, the teacher, to tie it in. First place, by the way, thank you for doing that. That's among the most important things that anybody can do. So uh, one of the, the issues that we have to deal with is, in, in essence, what you're hearing a lot from the conservatives is they say, yeah, we did the 86 thing. Uh, but part of the thing that was promised there was that we were going to have border security so that we would not have to deal with it again. So starting from President Reagan, that border security aspect didn't take place. There's a lack of trust there. We have to deal with that, and I think that we can. Um, and then to you, sir, what do we have to do? One of the issues that we have to deal with, I and mean, we have to get, it's not quite, I mean, I don't disagree, but I just want to add something. If the speaker today, were to say, we're going to put this on the floor, and he doesn't have the majority of Republicans, he ceases to be, I think he, he's gone. He can't do that. We just have different rules than they had, uh, the Democrats had when they were in control. Um, so it requires more of a, you know, we have to get more folks to be on top of that. One of the issues that we need to that convince folks by policy, not by talk, is that we're not going to do this again, that we're going to deal with this, that we're going to provide border security, et cetera, and that we're not going to do this again. And that we're going to have zero tolerance, by the way, for any future law breaking. Uh, can we get there? I think we can. Lastly, I will uh, um, end how I started. It has been such a privilege working with these individuals. Uh, they're legitimate, decent people who care about this issue like few. But I will uh, end how I started. When it, when it comes to concern, passion, and effort, for the immigrants in this country, Luis Gutierrez is Thank in a league you. of his own. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. As you can see, I'm getting older. I need the glasses. Let me, um, first of all, thank the wonderful panelists uh, for coming together. And I just want to give you some parting thoughts. Look. Chamber of Commerce, AFL-CIO, never gotten along. They don't. They did on immigration. You can read the editorial, Nena, from the Wall Street Journal, Gabby from the New York Times. Obviously, ideological different points of view. They look like they're plagiarizing one another. No, seriously. Growers and the union created by Cesar Chavez reach an agreement. So there's a lot to celebrate because of your tenacity and your support and the diligence of our community. We've created that. It didn't happen in a vacuum. So there is that. Second, as we all agree, there exists a majority. There exists a majority. That's never happened before. I'm going to tell you something. When Democrats were in the majority in 2007, we didn't have a vote on comprehensive immigration reform, and we were nearly 250. Want to know why we didn't have a vote? 
because there weren't 218 Democrats for comprehensive immigration reform. We didn't do it in 2008 when we were in the majority in Democrats. We didn't do it in 2009. We didn't do it in 2010. And many of you begged and implored us to do it. You know what exists today? A majority. We passed the DREAM Act. Y si no fuera por ti, Mario, y un grupo pequeño de republicanos, we wouldn't have done that in the fall of 2010. It was like 208. It was, Mario joined us. But it was, we passed it 216 to 208. You want to know why? Because it was 208 Democrats and eight Republicans. That's not the way. We've seen that that is not a successful road. So look, when you look at this situation, you can look at everything and put it in some kind of perspective. Um, I want to say that, look, we can't look at this as one problem or another. I remember when the Hispanic Congressional Caucus and we were confronted and somebody said, oh, you have a Rubio problem. And what did we say as a caucus? I was very proud that day. We, I said, we don't have a Rubio problem. We have a deportation problem in this country. If Rubio's going to do something to stop the deportation of dreamers, I'm going to take my Democratic hat off and I'm going to put the one hat that I believe you always want me to have on. And that's the hat of the immigrant community and the most vulnerable about it. El que nos va a ayudar con esa hay que estar. I think as I listen, Democrats have to understand that we're not in the majority in the House of Representatives, so we can't have everything. And as you see, my colleagues reflect that understanding. Republicans, on the other hand, are the majority, but I think they should understand that they lost a referendum on November 6th on this issue. People want comprehensive immigration reform. So between Democrats and Republicans, each understanding their strengths and their weaknesses, I believe we can realize a real solution to this problem. Last two things. Look, we're about to come, Nana, upon two million deportations. Two million deportations under a Democratic administration. Two million deportations. You know what that means, folks, right? That means hundreds of thousands and millions of children without a mom or a dad. How many families, how many, how many husbands and wives have been separated and destroyed? And we have a bill in the Senate that doesn't allow them to come back and reunite. So all I'm trying to say is, you know what? We've got to get it done because there are issues and challenges for both parties on this. Y si no lo resolvemos, then shame on us. Lastly, I want to commend my colleagues for how they put the situation together. No va a ser perfecto. I want the perfect. You guys know me. I'm the consummate warrior on this issue. It won't be perfect. The Senate bill, I've already said I'll sign it. But what do we know about the Senate bill? It's not that I say it. The Congressional Budget Office has said the Senate bill will leave 3 million of the 11 million, not out of citizenship, out of legalization. Out of legalization. National Council of La Raza, one of our most respected think tanks evaluated the same Senate bill and said what? We'll leave three million, not out of citizenship, out of legalization, three million. Do you want to know something? Here's what I think our challenge is, is let's get done what we can today for the greatest number of people and do the greatest good for them. Because I know that if we sign that bill tomorrow at next year's conference, what will we be discussing? how we bring the other three million in. We won't give up until they're all in. We won't give up until they're all in. It may be hard to recognize, but this is a conference on policy. Y hay que dejar la mentira y la hipocresía y la, la falta de sinceridad intelectual. En el momento que tú y esos senadores hicieron el trabajo más magnífico, y yo lo aplaudo, and I'm going to say this, I'd vote for that bill today. Without even thinking about it, I'd vote for that bill today. Because I want to stop people from being deported, because I want to stop our women from being raped, because I want to stop people from having to die in that border, because I'm tired of people dying. And I'm tired of the divisions in our children. But you see what the challenge is. But you know what? We have that challenge. But we have Javier Becerra. Hmm? You heard him? Give him another round of applause. He's doing such a wonderful job. You've heard Zoe, Zoe Lofren. Thank you, Zoe. You have Yarmouth. Ah, que, que practico ese hombre, John Yarmouth, please. And what can we say? He has tenacity. He showed up with 
four other Democrats here, and he sticks with us. Diaz Ballard from Florida, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. You won't want to miss tomorrow evening's gala event, starting with a reception at 5 p.m. Please get there early so you have time to get through security. We cannot guarantee entrance after 7.15 p.m. The gala is the largest and most prestigious gathering of Hispanic, nonpartisan, public and private sector leaders in the nation, celebrating the achievements of the Latino community, and we will be joined by President Obama and the First Lady. The evening is packed with other amazing speakers, special guests, entertainment, and the presentation of CHCI's highest honors, the Chair's Medallion Award, and the CHCI Medallion of Excellence Award. Remember to tell your friends and family not to miss a beat. They can tune into the gala streaming live at hhm.chci.org slash livestream. I hope to see you tonight at the Reyes of Comedy. Have a great evening.